Here is chapters, or here are chapters 10 and 11 of Code Orange. Um, you can listen or you can mute my voice and read it yourself or you can follow along and listen. Ready? Here we go. Chapter 10. It was a close game. His parents were excited and then desperate, cheering and then moaning. It was all Minnie could do to mumble a syllable now and then. He wanted to tell his parents everything but he wanted them away from him, miles away, oceans away. And here they were on the same sofa. He couldn't follow the game. He, Mitty, who loved college basketball the most of any sport. When the camera panned the crowd at, at Notre Dame, he saw only Variola Major working its way through 11,000 people. UConn lost. Mitty, Har Mitty hardly noticed. Normally, Mitty yelled and stomped, threw things and high-fived, placed rational or insane bets, and groaned afterward about how Yukon should have played better. Now, he just waited quietly while his father wound down from the excitement and the frustration of a loss, until at last, Mitty could retire to the safety and privacy of his room. He couldn't sit. He couldn't lie down. He couldn't do anything except listen to the echoes of electronic voices. Infectivity may have survived. Answer ASAP. The case of smallpox would take precedence over any health problem on earth. I have forwarded your email to the FBI. He was aware of his parents in their room and the blockade of closets and bathrooms between them. He heard when they turned off their bedroom TV and closed their books. Except for sports, they never watched TV without also reading. It seemed to Minnie that they missed the entire point of television. At last, all was still and they were asleep. And Mitty, too, was still. When he was little, Mitty had often been mesmerized by the round windows and the humming clothes dryers in the building's laundry room. He would stand holding his nanny's hand, watching socks inside get thrown against the glass, and then underwear, followed by pillowcases, and here would come those socks again. His thoughts had always been like that, like flailing sleeves of shirts, <coughs> revolving and tumbling. The cycle had ended. Mitty's mind lay as quiet as folded laundry. Call the CDC hotline. If he called the CDC and said, I opened this old book and handled old smallpox scabs and I might be infected, well, wouldn't they just laugh? But if they didn't laugh, if they came to his house, wanted to examine him, then what? He did not want to be a specimen. Demon in the Freezer described what happened to an English victim in the 1970s who'd gotten sick from a laboratory accident and to a German victim in 1969 who'd been traveling through India in an area where smallpox still existed. These patients had become display items, public property. They'd been stared at, studied, and examined. And furthermore, every person they had come near had been stared at, studied, and examined. Those two victims had had no meaning to anybody except that they could kill by breathing. Typhoid Mary. Nobody had cared what that poor woman thought or hoped for. Her life didn't matter. She was a threat. Lock her up. Mitty thought, as, of, as he often did, because it was every athlete's fear about the most unfortunate ball player in history. Bill Buckner, who let a ground ball roll between his legs and lost Game 6 of the 1986 World Series for the Red Sox. Bill Buckner entered history because of one split second when he goofed. Mitty, too, would find a place in history, but his would be worse. He'd be the one who brought smallpox back. If he got smallpox, they would ring vaccinate Manhattan. There would be immunization stations in Grand Central and at St. Raphael's. The city would go through hell, all because Mitty Blake had done his homework for a change. Mitty slept in shorts and an, ex and an extra-large Old Navy t-shirt. Around 2 a.m., he went into his bathroom and peeled them off. In front of the mirrors, he examined himself. No lesions, but it was too early anyway. This was not yet dawn of day 10. He took out his old medical texts again. He didn't care what anybody modern said. He needed guys who knew what they were talking about, who'd been there, done that, buried the victims. Each old source said the same thing. No symptoms and no way to infect anybody else for 12 to 14 days after exposure. He felt like a person who knows perfectly well why he's coughing, bleeding, and exhausted. He's got cancer. 
but still he won't go to the doctor because as long as the diagnosis isn't definite, it's possible to pretend. There was a difference here. If you didn't treat your cancer, it was your problem. And if you didn't treat smallpox, it was the world's problem. If Mitty pretended he was fine, and then he got smallpox and infected other people, Mitty Blake would be a murderer. Because he would have known. It would not be an accident. What were the chances that he would get sick? A chance in a thousand? A chance in a million? I mean, any chance was still a chance. That's why people bought lottery tickets. Somebody had to win. And somebody had to lose. Mitty considered the possibilities. A, he wouldn't get smallpox, and he'd still have to write that paper comparing monsters to diseases. That alone might kill him. B, he wouldn't get smallpox, but he'd be too lazy to write the paper. To write the paper. Oh dear. There, to write the paper, and he'd flunk English along with every other subject. C, he wouldn't get smallpox. He'd write brilliant papers, graduate a year early with high honors, and make everybody proud. Or D, he'd get smallpox. Mitty was suddenly gripped by a new fear, that he had lost the envelope. God, guys in dark suits carrying hidden weapons would descend on him, and they'd have, and he'd have nothing. They'd yell, what envelope? You liar, wasting government time, terrifying Manhattan, and you never had anything? You made it up so you could be the center of attention? They'd toss the apartment, make his mother cry, probably fine Mitty or even jail him for wasting their time. His father would regard him with that sad look. The one that said, I want to be proud of you, son, but yet again. Mitty's fear was well placed. There was no envelope in the book. He held the book by its spine and shook it upside down and carefully turned every page a second time. Mitty's pulse rate would have been just right if he was a hummingbird. He'd taken the book to school. Had the envelope fallen out in the library? Was it floating around? Did Olivia have it? His mom, the maid? And then Mitty swore, threw the stupid book down and picked up the right one. The envelope was exactly where he left it. In a minute, he'd be scared of spiders. He checked the contents of the envelope. I just proved why I'm at the bottom of the junior class, thought Mitty. The only thing stupider than handling the virus once is to handle it a second time. He came to one decision anyway. He was getting rid of the scabs. If the FBI did show up, which, you know, they wouldn't. The whole idea was ridiculous. They had better things to do. But if they did, so what if he didn't have any scabs? He decided on the waterlogged route because he didn't want airborne dust floating around. He went into the kitchen, got a heavy-duty plastic garbage bag, put the, ba the book into the bag, let it, set it in a sink, and filled it from the tap. The book did not sop up water, so he rifled the pages to let the water in. Some scientist somewhere would grieve. This scab was never going to be tested by anybody for anything. When the book had turned to paste, he tied the bag shut, put it inside a second bag, and went to the front door of his apartment. Building rules required carpet so the people living beneath you didn't hear your footsteps, and the Blakes had very thick padding under very thick carpet. No need to tiptoe. He opened the deadbolt carefully so no metallic snick would disturb his parents' sleep. Leaving the door ajar, he went down the hall to the trash room. He opened the waist-high slot in the wall and dropped his nightmare down the chute. It would hit bottom and join the garbage from all other, depart uh, all other de apartments, be collected in even larger plastic bags, and set out on the sidewalk for the garbage men, get tossed into a truck, driven to the river, emptied onto a scow, and barged to a landfill. Back in his bedroom, he thought, I could go off to some remote place and tough it out alone. I wouldn't have to stick it out very long. If I bail tomorrow and hide somewhere by Sunday morning, which is day 15, I'll know the score. Where could he hide out? His Aunt Betty had a terrific little retreat in the woods in the Ad Adirondacks, up near Lake Placid. But even if he could get there, which he couldn't, it wasn't heated. The water was turned off for the winter and there was no food. There would be snow, though, and the people looking after the cabin would see Mitty's tracks. And once he found wood and kindling and started a fire in the little stove, they'd see smoke rising and come over. What would Mitty do then? Call out, hi, don't come in, fatal disease here. But say he did come up with a hiding place. If he didn't get smallpox, 
Sunday afternoon, he could phone his parents, who would be a little bent out of shape by then, but uh, that happened when you had a son. You know, make up a story. It would have to be quite a story. If he did get sick, he was looking at five or six weeks of suffering and healing. Every description of smallpox was gruesome, but one really gruesome thing was that you were so sick you couldn't get out of bed. You not only couldn't nurse yourself, but you got stuck to your own mattress when your pustules oozed and dried up. So if he went to the cabin in the mountains, he'd be too sick to get up, plus he'd freeze to death when the wood stove went out. Or he could call the CDC. Anybody else would summon experts, counselors, agencies, and advisors. But Mitty wanted to face it alone. He did not want his parents making this decision for him. He did not want doctors making the decision for him. And he most certainly did not want a government agency doing it. It was his life, his body. In some, in some book or other, he remembered somebody saying something. He remembered somebody saying about somebody else, better if he had never lived. Did he remember this from church, maybe? The only book in church was generally the Bible. Who would the Bible said that about? What if people said of Mitty, better if he had never lived? It was still dark out when Mitty headed to school. Streetlights illuminated Broadway. The occasional taxi cruised by. Manhattanites didn't have to get up early since they were already there, but lots of people had stuff to do before work. They were already walking dogs, running a few pre-morning shower miles, going out to buy a paper or fresh bagels. Mitty was cut off by an actual club of young mothers, babies warm and barely visible behind the zipped-up plastic over their strollers, headed to Central Park for a dawn jog. He didn't see anybody who deserved to get smallpox. He went to a diner at the corner of 68th and Columbus and ordered scrambled eggs, bacon, fried potatoes, toast, fresh squeezed orange juice, and coffee. Before it came, he was starving. When it was set in front of him, he had no appetite. Mitty's parents always woke up to 1010 10 wins. All news, all the time. You give us 20 minutes, we'll give you the world. Mitty's mother was calm during traffic and weather, but she could get anxious about headline news. Would it be bad? Would it be worse? It would be worse if smallpox came back. His father found the color-coded Homeland Security, uh, Security terror warnings both exhausting and comic. Say it was yellow. Exactly what caution was he supposed to follow? Skip the gym? If it got raised, what was he supposed to stay home from work? Smallpox would be a reason to stay home. Mitty studied his watch, calculating the deadline. He'd get through the day somehow without saying anything to anybody. Unless, of course, the FBI showed up. Although even his action movie trained mind, Mitty could not picture being called out of class to chat with FBI agents. Tonight, He'd tell his parents what was up, because the only thing worse than finding out would be finding out from strangers. Then together, they'd call that CDC hotline. And he knew, he completely knew, he knew for a fact that the CDC would say, 100-year-old scabs, what a joke. Finish your little school paper, Sonny, and don't bother us again. Unless they put him in isolation and hovered over him wearing 20 layers of protective material while television news showed sobbing St. Ray students getting shots. At the diner, Minnie left a full plate and a large tip. He slung his backpack over one shoulder and headed towards school. He was still early. Nobody else would even be dressed yet. He found himself oddly uncomfortable with the press of pedestrians and instead of walking up Columbus or Am Amsterdam or Broadway, he shifted over to West End Avenue, but even West End, practically vacant compared to the other streets, felt packed. Then he shifted even farther west to Riverside Drive. He never walked there because it was boring. It was not Mitty's nature to seek solitude. Mitty loved a crowd. Strangers often commented on how New Yorkers did not make eye contact. Strangers figured that every New Yorker was afraid of every other New Yorker. But that wasn't the reason. If you looked into the eyes of the person coming in your direction, you were drawn toward them and the two of you bumped into each other. But if your eyes didn't meet, you avoided each other perfectly, even on crowded platforms during rush hour. Only once, New Year's Eve in Times Square, had Mitty been in a crowd too tight for him to move, let alone avoid contact. 
He'd made friends with everybody in the mob. He cut past the statue of Eleanor Roosevelt and hardly noticed the fenced-in dog exercise park, where usually he fell in love with at least one dog. He went through a windy, a windy pedestrian tunnel under the West Side Highway, already solid with commuter cars, and came out on the stretch of park that ran for miles along the Hudson River. He walked past the marina, empty ball fields, and the shut-down restaurants of summer. He could not walk fast enough to escape the thoughts crawling under him, over him. I don't want to be near people because the books could be wrong about the 12 days, he thought. What if it's only nine days? What if it's now? His cell phone rang, but he didn't look at it. The desire to communicate had left Minnie. He felt curiously outside of his skin, or maybe inside it, waiting for his variola to detonate. Minnie Blake sat on a bench facing the Hudson and the low, dull buildings of New Jersey on the far side. A red tug pulled a long barge. A, hel a traffic helicopter surveyed the George Washington Bridge. He balanced his laptop on his knees and began to write. So, Mom, Dad, this is a letter. I'm trying to be intelligent here, even though it goes, it goes against a lifetime of training. Well, nothing you trained me in, I promise. You always did the right thing. I trained myself to be stupid. First, read my science report, and then you'll know what smallpox is. What it is, is a true, real weapon of mass destruction. Now, you finished reading that. Here's what happened on Sunday, February 1st. In one of the old medical texts you bought from that doctor, Mom, I found an envelope full of scabs from a smallpox epidemic in 1902. I handled them, breathed in their dust. So now what? Could I, Mitty Blake, get smallpox from those scabs? I can't tell. I've been doing research all week and I still can't tell. The odds are in my favor that the virus is dead, but print out my emails from where I asked around. You'll see what the majority opinion is. It might not be dead. I could have called the CDC in Atlanta. They handle AIDS and West Nile virus and SARS and stuff. And they could have given me a vaccine, which might or might not have had an effect. I think they're guessing about whether it could help, but it's too late. I wasn't paying attention. All I cared about was, do I need one more sentence for my stupid paper? But isn't... It isn't the paper that's stupid. Because here's the thing. Suppose inside my body the first live smallpox in two generations is getting ready to burst. Whether I live or die, whether I'm scarred or not, that stuff doesn't matter. What matters is that the virus would exist. In only hours, I might be infecting people. Me. It's impossible. Except it's possible. I'm afraid. I've got an idea now what this disease is, but I'm more afraid of giving it to other people. That would be the bad part. Not getting it, but giving it. You're saying to me, Mitty, just go to a hospital. I mean, that sounds easy, but I don't want to be an exhibit. This girl in biology class, Marcy, well, her disease is avian flu, which has been in, all the, in the news all month. Chickens in Asia get the flu, which also sounds impossible. It's so human. Do the chickens get a fever and a cough? Anyway, the people handling these chickens also get the flu. Marcy's all proud of this photograph she cut from the post of sisters in Thailand who died of Asian flu. They're lying in their coffins. The pictures have been printed all over the world. And you know what? Nobody's going to photograph me lying in my coffin or covered in smallpox. Plus, I don't want to be stupid. Say I rush to the authorities, whimpering and scaring the whole city, and people go berserk and seal their doors, and a million plane flights get canceled, and then nothing happens. I'm just this low IQ jerk. But if I do get smallpox, aside from the photographs of me in my coffin, they'll do that ring vaccination Dr. Henderson perfected. And the problem is, Americans don't stay in their rings like some peasant in a Bangladesh rice field 50 years ago. They get on planes, trains, buses, ferries. They drive SUVs, vans, cars, and motorcycles. I mean, they leave town. They leave the state. They even leave the country. My virus would hit the world. Read that paragraph on how fast the entire population of the world would get smallpox. I know soldiers in Iraq are afraid. I know refugees in Sierra Leone or Rwanda or Afghanistan are afraid. But they can see the thing they're afraid of. 
I can't see what I'm afraid of. I can't even tell if it's there. I know the logical thing is to go tell somebody, but mom, dad, here's the thing. They can't do anything about it if I have smallpox now. <laughs> Derek's favorite topic is what lunatic sent anthrax through the mail. But if I send smallpox through New York, I'm not a lunatic. I'm a mass murderer who knew exactly what was going to happen. I'm no different from those 19 murderers who drove their planes into us on September 11th. And if I get hospitalized in time, and even if nobody else caught smallpox, and even if they kept the virus limited to my body in my room, variable major would exist again. You wouldn't believe these scientists who want to keep smallpox around. They want to combine smallpox with monkeypox or whatever just to see what happens. I can't do anything about the virus the CDC has locked up, but I can keep it from existing in actual society. I've been thinking about that word, society. It means all of us in New York, every age, race, job, weight, and religion. Every time we laugh or sing, ride the elevator, buy a coffee, go to the theater, eat in a restaurant, jog in the park. We're society. I don't want to be the typhoid Mary of my society. You have all these great plans for my future, but what if my future is to be smallpox midi? Don't laugh. I'm not laughing. Here's what I'm thinking. If this is a live virus and it's the only one in the entire world, I should not let it live. And if I have it, and if I let the world hospitalize me, I let the virus out into society, I give it life. There is only one way to be sure I don't give anybody else this disease. There's only one way to be sure that no ambulance driver, no doctor, no mother, no father, no classmate, no kid in a stroller, no guy on a bike, no waiter in a diner, not one person in New York gets sick from me. And that way is to die before I get sick then the virus, virus dies with me. Chapter 11. Guess what Minnie has agreed to write about? Mrs. Abrams said to the class. Monsters, mythical and biological. Isn't that brilliant? Actually, it seemed weird and maybe even meaningless, but nobody said anything. They all knew Minnie had not agreed. He'd been railroaded. Building on your biology project is so wise of you, Mitty, Mrs. Abrams told him. Mitty smiled politely. He could hardly hear her. His thoughts were thundering in his head like the bass on the stereo turned all the way up. It would be easy enough to die. He'd just get up in the night, leave the apartment building by the back door, and nobody would see him go because there was nobody on duty at the back during the night. You could always get out of the building because of fire laws, but you couldn't always get in because of safety laws. Walk a few blocks up, a few blocks over, there was the Hudson River. Step in, start swimming, and soon enough, the cold and the current would win. But could he do that to his parents? Minnie believed suicide was the most vicious thing a child could do to his mother and father. It was saying, you don't matter enough to me to stay alive. It was saying, I hate you so much, I'm going to make you think about my dead body every day of your life. But Mitty would be doing this for the opposite reason. He'd be saying, you and the world matter so much, I can't let you be exposed to disease. But did that justify it? Mitty? Mitty roused himself. They were in the library again. He could tell by all those rows of books. Oh, hi, Mr. Lynch, how are you? Worrying about you. Come on, Minnie, make an effort. <laughs> I'm, I'm all efforted out. Well, you were off to such a great start. How about an interview? Have you tried to get one yet? Uh, yes, Minnie said slowly. And? Minnie felt disconnected. Eventually, he said, uh, nobody, nobody wrote me back. You just don't know the right people, Minnie, said Mate. My father knows everyone. I can help you. <laughs> Minnie would rather get smallpox. The principal did not call Minnie to his office. The secretary did not summon him to the phone. The FBI did not spring into the classroom. The choice was still Minnie's. 
Many had not frequently observed acts of personal physical courage. I'm like, sure, in action films or on TV, but in real life in America, uh, who exhibited physical courage? Only in extreme circumstances or faked ones on TV did the need for courage arise. Nobody in the city had to face the wilderness or a panther. Their problems were a full parking lot or final exams. Even in true, if true danger was coming, like a hurricane, you just bought your extra quart of milk and watched it on television. In fact, many could think of only two current examples of people walking into true danger and fighting back. The firefighters and police officers of 9-11 and the soldiers sent to Afghanistan and Iraq. How vividly many remembered a video of firefighters running into one of the towers. Young men trained to rescue the innocent, regardless of danger to themselves. The nation and many stood in awe. But in everyday life, physical challenge consisted of inline skating on a paved path in a civilized park. Mental challenge consisted of counting carbohydrates. Moral challenge consisted of deciding whether to cheat on a quiz. I still have time, he reminded himself. I can delete my letter to my parents. I can call the hotline or I can shrug and tell myself nothing could happen. When school was out, he headed straight home. He had things to do, but Olivia caught up to him. She had an odd, fragile smile on her face. Mitty, she said, as if he might be entire, somebody else entirely. He stopped walking. He hadn't wanted his parents near him. He didn't want Olivia near him either. Let's walk in the park, she said. Mitty hesitated. Thinking about it, and thinking about it, and her face fell. It wasn't how he wanted to say goodbye. Okay, he said finally. It's pretty nice out, although it wasn't. Central Park, magnificent trees and awesome views, unexpected sculptures and stunning skylines. What if he never saw Central Park again? For Olivia, more than anything, Central Park meant dogs. Everybody on the Upper West Side had babies in strollers or dogs on leashes or both. Olivia greeted every dog walker, knelt to rub every dog's ears, and told every dog how beautiful he was. Then she had to ask the dog's name and verify the dog's breed and, of course, discuss her own dogs. Olivia cuddled a Rhodesian Ridgeback and then a pair of blind white labs, a brace of bouncing long-haired dachshunds, and finally a tall, proud shepherd. Many thought of Macaulay, who had written, The smallpox was always present, filling the churchyards with corpses, tormenting with constant fears all whom it had not yet stricken, leaving on those whose lives it spared the hideous traces of its power, making the eyes and cheeks of a betrothed maiden objects of horror to the lover. Through the leafless trees, he could see the stone tower of the American Museum of Natural History, Infectious disease was natural history. God, don't let me be a chapter in that kind of history, he thought. Olivia took his hand before he could stop her. They walked on together. Olivia swung his hand slightly. Saturday is Valentine's Day. Then he thought of what his Valentine's gift to New York City might be. He extricated his hand. Olivia's cheek stained red. and She blinked hard, looking away from him. He knew what it meant for a girl to mention Valentine's Day. And he and Olivia were at the right stage for Valentine's Day. Ready to be together. Not for study and not for school, but for love. He did not want to touch her. Even though that was the only thing he wanted. He looked at the bare trees. They would leaf out in spring. Would he be there to see them? Olivia waited for him to speak. He knew what she was really asking. How much do we like each other? A lot, thought Mitty, but he didn't say anything. She took a step back from him and he ignored it. She turned and took one step in the opposite direction. He said nothing. Her shoulders slumped. He knew she was crying. She walked away and he let her go.